So, welcome everyone for this last KISS seminar of this season. We are very glad to welcome Robert Wall, who is going to talk about quantum superposition of massive bodies. So, uh, the talk will be uh, half an hour. If you have short clarifying questions, you can ask them. Otherwise, you keep them for the end and we will have plenty of time for discussion. So, Robert, it's your turn. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So let me uh, screen share. Okay, and let me make sure that's all uh, visible. And if so, I'll start. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about work that was actually done about three years ago with these uh, co-authors, and I noticed at least uh, two of them uh, uh, in the participants uh, uh, right now, as well as also notice a number of other people in the participants that I'd like to say hello to. Um, I've actually uh, recently returned to this issue to make some of the arguments actually more general and precise. I mean, work that is now in progress uh, with the student, but I'm not, I'll, I'm going to talk about this original work that was uh, posted and published three years ago uh, in this, uh, in this talk. Um, so I don't, I undoubtedly would not have to kind of make any general remarks about quantization of gravity to this group that's, I think, been, uh, you know, engaged in these issues uh, uh, throughout these seminars. Uh, but there is a major issue of how to do quantum gravity, I mean, that arises in this theory, not others, because you don't have this background space-time structure that plays a role uh, you know, in the structure that, that is used to formulate quantum theory, and it's not obvious how to proceed without it. So there have certainly been suggestions over the years that maybe gravity should be fundamentally classical, uh, or that we have to very radically uh, modify the basic tenets of quantum theory. Uh, of course, there have been at least equally many, I think probably a lot more arguments uh, against this and that gravity must be quantized as well. Uh, I would certainly unequivocally side with that latter view, but whatever view you might have on the quantization of gravity, I think there's a lot of insight to be gained when you look at situations where you have some quantum source, perhaps in a regime that ought to be perfectly well describable with Schrodinger quantum mechanics, but you want to consider the gravitational effects of that source uh, and seeing whether you run into inconsistencies if you don't have uh, a quantization of gravity, uh, or even if you Maybe you run into inconsistencies even if you do, but it's interesting to study this uh, kind of situation and also, uh, you know, get a feeling for what, if anything, really needs to be quantized. Well, a few years ago, I mean, a couple of years before the work that I'm talking about, there was re a really beautiful Gedanken experiment that was uh, proposed by uh, Mari De Palma and Giovanetti. Uh, and it's a really nice thing to think about. I mean, again, whatever your views of quantum gravity are, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very nice Gedanken experiment to think about. And it's one that, I mean, it's the analysis of this Gedanken experiment that I'll be talking about in this uh, in this talk. Um, so, well, before I describe the Gedanken experiment, I want to make sure everybody's aware that I'm going to uh, 
set h bar and c equals one everywhere. And I'm going to make all of the calculations that I'm going to describe in this talk are back of the envelope uh, calculations in many cases using, you know, classical Newtonian gravity to get estimates of things or classical electrodynamics to get estimates of things. Of course, there'll be H bar in this too. It's not all classical. And I'm going to ignore any order unity factors when making estimates. This is actually something that I have very recently uh, improved upon, but I won't be uh, talking about it. And it'll clutter the main main points of this talk if I do get into, into it. So I'm going to now describe the Gedanken experiment. I'm going to take even though the talk is only half an hour long, I'm going to take some time to do that because uh, this is the key thing. So I'm first going to describe it in words, and then I'll show you a space-time diagram where I'll be able to go over everything that I've said again, but it'll be a little bit more uh, clear. So we have uh, two experiment experimentalists, uh, out of the ubiquitous uh, Alice and Bob, uh, but you've got to think of a more than competent, highly skilled experimentalist. So this is not me. Uh, this is a different Bob. And they're separated by some, well, large distance D, you should think of it. I mean, we'll see what it's large compared to and so on. And each of them has a particle, but they're doing totally different things with the particle. I'm going to assume that they're in a regime where their particle can be treated non-relativistically by Schrodinger quantum mechanics. Although again, the details are not going to uh, enter very sharply. And now there's both an electromagnetic and gravitational version of this. Uh, I'm more interested in the gravitational version, but these are very parallel and it's easier to explain the electromagnetic version. So I'm mainly going to talk about the electromagnetic version, but right now I could be talking about either. So in the electromagnetic version, the particles are charged and we neglect gravity. In the gravitational version, the particles are uncharged, but uh, the gravitational interaction is the only thing that we'll consider. Okay, so now before and well before the times that I'm going to be otherwise anal analyzing, uh, Alice is sup supposed to have sent her particle through a stern gerlach apparatus and put it in a 50, per 50 superposition of beams. I mean, it's only one particle, but I guess beam would be a good name for it, that are separated by some distance d that's much smaller than the separation between Alice and Bob. And prior to this time, Bob keeps his particle in a trap. Bob is going to be the detector, uh, play the role of a, uh, you know, trying to detect what Alice has done. Um, now, beginning at time t equals zero, uh, the time that I'm going to be, from which I'm going to be analyzing what goes on further, Alice tries to recombine her 50-50 particle beam uh, and see if the beam has remained coherent. So you can think of it as sending her particle through some reversing stern gerlach apparatus that puts the beams back together and then performing some interference experiment. And she's supposed to, this is supposed to start at t equals zero and be done by time ta, or at least I'm going to call ta the time at which she's finished. At t equals zero, well, Bob might just to, you know, graphically illustrate the alternatives might keep the particle in, a, in its trap, but the more interesting case would be where he releases it. And if he releases it, it's, there's going to be some correlation of the position of the particle with uh, 
which beam Alice's particle was in, because if it was closer to his, there'll be more attraction, let's say, if these are oppositely charged particles or automatically in gravity. Uh, and in principle, he should be able to measure uh, by looking at the difference in displacement of his particle, uh, well, looking carefully at the displacement of his particle, he should be able to tell which path Alice's particle took. And now the question is, I'll show this again in a diagram, but the question is, if we make the time of Bob's experiment and the time of Alice's experiment smaller than the light travel time between them, is Alice going to succeed in her interference experiment? So what's the uh, issue here? Uh, what's the setup? Let me again take a little bit of time to now draw you a space-time diagram of what's going on here. So this World 2 region is Alice's lab. Uh, this sort of World 2 region here is uh, where Bob is operating his experiment. And as I said, way in the past, uh, Alice sent her particle through some sort of stern gerlock apparatus and broke it up into this 50-50 superposition. And what she does now is recombine these beams. And this drawing up here is supposed to illustrate what the alternative outcomes could be if she maintained super uh, coherency of these two beams, they will interfere when they're recombined. And one will get, you know, the what, this is only supposed to be a cartoon to illustrate that you'd get a kind of wiggly effects uh, coming arising from interference of effects of these two uh, beams. On the other hand, if Alice failed to maintain coherency between these beams and this became a mixed state somehow, I mean, her beams became entangled with something else, uh, um, then, of, then of course you'd get some different pattern. Now, of course, in one experiment, you might have a lot of trouble telling the difference, but, uh, you know, we could in principle, repeat this many times and see what's what's going on. Okay, so now why is there an issue here? I mean, if she's really careful, you'd think she ought to be able to keep the coherency and and uh, get interference. But Bob is going to be sensitive to the Coulomb fields of these particles or Newtonian-like fields in the gravitational case. Let me just talk about the electromagnetic case here for definiteness. So, you know, if his particle is oppositely charged from Alice's, if Alice's particle is over here, there'll be uh, a stronger attraction and his particle expectation value at least will end up over here. Whereas in the other alternative, it should end up over here. If he can measure the position difference between these two alternatives, uh, well, that means that you know these two possible final states are essentially orthogonal, but they must be entangled or at least correlated with uh, Alice's. Uh, that means that Alice can't. Uh, have maintained coherence and she'll get this non-wiggly result when she recombines. But of course, if Bob kept his particle in the trap, there would be no entanglement or correlation with Alice's particle. And there's no reason why, certainly no reason due to Bob, why she wouldn't, couldn't, if she's a spectacular experimentalist, why she could, wouldn't get this interference pattern. But of course, what Bob, if this is all done within a light travel time, by causality, what Bob does uh, 
or doesn't do shouldn't be able to affect Alice. Um, so this is all set up for either, I mean, if Bob, at least if Bob can make this measurement, and of course, if the effects are, you know, if Alice's particle is charged enough or whatever, he certainly should be able to make this measurement. Um, but this seems to lead to, you know, a violation of either causality or, well, complementarity is the word I learned to use to describe the, uh, you know, what the quantum state would have to be that has some, you know, entanglement or correlation between these particles. Okay, so I hopefully have set up the problem. Now I only have 15 minutes or so to resolve it. Um, so let's analyze now what happens and, you know, does Alice, uh, again, the big question is if these experiments are done within the light travel time, does Alice's interference experiment succeed? And the first thing to notice is that in some sense, I've, you know, I've talked about Alice's particle that might've gone to the left and might've gone to the right. And of course there's Bob's particle and initially there's no entanglement. There's just a nice tensor product state between Bob and Alice, but I'm leaving the electromagnetic field out of this description. I was only talking about the particles and we shouldn't leave it out of the description because in the initial state, uh, in some sense, the Alice's particle is already entangled with the electromagnetic field being either the Coulomb field for the left moving beam or the Coulomb field for the right moving beam, but it's correlated in this way. And in some sense, this means that Alice's particle is already decohered at t equals zero. Now, Unruh has given a very nice name for this kind of decoherence, false decoherence, and there's a nice paper by Unruh discussing this, um, because it's true that in some sense, Alice's particle is decohered at t equals zero, but if she carefully recombines her particle, these fields will also go back to each other if she does it slowly and carefully enough, and she'll have no problem uh, uh, you know, succeeding. Well, she'll have plenty of experimental problems, but if she's a spectacular experimentalist, she'll have no problem uh, getting the recombined particle to interfere, to show the interference uh, effects. But this is very important, I think, to understand in terms of how, uh, well, decoherence might arise, uh, or, you know, an underlying understanding of, of, uh, of, of this. But this does not resolve the problem. This is uh, as Unruh has discussed, a false decoherence. So we now have to look at what are, to understand what's going on, we have to look at what the limitations are on Bob succeeding in measuring the position difference between left and right with his experiment, uh, and the limitations then on Alice herself in terms of just doing the interference, keeping the, maintaining the coherence uh, uh, through the experiment, even in the absence of Bob. Okay, well, there's a key limitation on Bob's ability to measure which path Alice's particle went, went on, which corresponds to a limitation on how correlated the position of, you know, Bob's final state will be with Alice's and how much decoherence there uh, uh, therefore can be, uh, you know, the minimum decoherence that Bob can uh, 
say must be there in Alice's particle. And that's from uh, the, the key limitation comes from vacuum fluctuations. I'm doing the electromagnetic case, so of the electromagnetic field. And when averaged over a region of linear size r, or what's really relevant here, time t, uh, t equals, you know, I'm setting c equals one, so this can be a, a time dimension. The vacuum fluctuations are of order one over, well, time squared or linear size of the region that you're considering uh, squared. So here we're doing the experiment in this time t sub bob, tb. Um, what kind of effect do these fluctuations have on the path of a particle? Well, you can see that just by integrating Newton's second law over this time r. And amazingly, you get the result that these fluctuations will cause position fluctuations of Bob's particle of order q over m independently of what the time of the experiment is. If you do a longer experiment, the fluctuations act for much longer, but they're, they average out to nearly zero. And if you integrate this equation, you'll get this answer. If you do it for a very short amount of time, well, there's very little time for the particle to move, but the electric field fluctuations are huge. So you get this answer no matter what. So if Bob is going to succeed in his experiment, he's going to need a position uh, difference. This delta x here is going to have to be above the quantum noise uh, produced by the vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. Uh, now, what is the delta x? Well, the delta x uh, is really coming from the effective dipole of Alice's particle being of charge Q being in these two alternative positions. And if you calculate what effect that would have on Bob's particle, I mean, just integrating again Newton's second law, but with uh, the electric field of this, of a dipole, uh, this is what you get. So this has to be larger for Bob to succeed than this. Uh, so that all depends on how big the dipole is. And of course, the TB is less than D in the case I want to consider, but we could consider a general, more general case too with this analysis. Okay, what about Alice's coherence? Uh, well, she's limited by emission of quantum electromagnetic radiation. Uh, when she closes this superposition of her components, this effective dipole that she's created is going to be reduced to zero in the time of her experiment. Um, if and any emission of photons are then going to be entangled with these two alternative states. Um, a good way of thinking about that, if that isn't immediately clear, would be ima to imagine that one of these paths remains inertial and the other one is the one that gets, you know, the path altered to recombine with this first one. So then you could say that if the particle followed this path, there'd be no emission at all. If the particle followed this path, though, there might be emission of photons. So if you see a photon, you know it followed this path. I mean, more generally, if, you, if both paths are non-inertial, if you see a photon that is coming associated with the closing of this dipole, uh, you know, that will give you the, you know, the, that will entangle with the different 
paths. I, I've said that badly, but I think my meaning should be reasonably clear. So if we're going to emit photons from the closing of the dipole, the closing of the superposition, we're going to, if Alice emits a photon, she's going to destroy the uh, coherence independently of what Bob does. So how do we figure out what that is? Well, the Larmor formula tells us uh, that this is an estimate of the radiated energy in the whole process. That should come out in photons of frequency one over TA, um, which means that of order this number of photons will be emitted in Alice's experiment. And if you emit around one or more, then Alice is going to fail in her interference experiment no matter what. Okay, so now we're ready to look at the outcome of the Gedanken experiment. And the case, we can analyze any case, but the case of most interest is where the experiments are done within a light travel time. And that all then depends on whether this dipole is smaller than this light travel time uh, or not. Uh, if it is, if the dipole is less than TA, then Alice uh, can avoid emitting entangling photons. So if not for Bob, she'd succeed in her interference experiment. But if you ask what, Bob, how Bob is doing under this case where the dipole is smaller than TA, you get this factor that is less than one in the case that the experiments are done within a light travel time. And Bob's measurement is lost, then is correspondingly lost in the vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. So Bob won't be able to get uh, which path information, and there's no reason why Alice's interference experiment will run into problems. She'll succeed. On the other hand, if you make the dipole big enough, then Bob could measure which path, but precisely in this case, Alice's particle is going to emit entangling radiation that's going to destroy the coherence of the wave function on its own. On its own. So Alice's interference experiment is going to fail, and it doesn't really matter what Bob does. Bob could have gotten which path information, uh, you know, in this space-like regime, but he can't be convicted in court for messing up Alice's experiment. Alice did it on her own, uh, emitting the photons. So what are the lessons from this? Well, in order to get a consistent analysis of, in this electromagnetic case, uh, we need the vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field, and we need the quantization of electromagnetic radiation in order to get to avoid problems. If we didn't have vacuum fluctuations, Bob would have been able to get which path information in a situation where Alice doesn't emit photons. So we would have a violation of causality or, or complementarity. Uh, and if you didn't have quantized radiation, then in the large dipole case, Bob, where uh, Bob is able to get the information, uh, but Alice, if not influenced with Bob, by Bob, Alice would be able to recohere her particle if she wasn't emitting photons. Uh, um, so either she would have had to have been uh, uh, influenced by Bob or, uh, you know, violating causality, or there would have to be a violation of complementarity again. Okay, well, I don't have a lot of time left 
to discuss the gravitational case, but if you followed that, uh, then things are extremely similar in the gravitational case. The limit from quantum fluctuations now, instead of being this charge to mass ratio of Bob's particle in units where H bar and C are one, uh, the limit is now the Planck length. I mean, there's really more to be said because you only can really talk about relative distances uh, in the gravitational case. So you really need to look at the geodesic deviation equation to get your relative to position from some fiducial you know, position that you're measuring things relative to. But anyway, it all works out, not surprisingly. It's hard to imagine there'd be anything else but the Planck length that would come into this. So we're going to need Bob to be able, you know, to have an effect larger than the Planck length to succeed in his measurement. Now, you might think that the Alice's case would be very similar. I mean, you know, she's now making a mass dipole instead of a, an electric dipole when she uh, separates her particles into the two beams. But it has to be taken into account that, in fact, she isn't, even though it looks like she might be making a mass dipole, uh, she can't be in, and she isn't, in gravity because there is, well, at least in linearized gravity, a strict conservation of center of mass uh, um, uh, result or whatever. The, uh, and well, a result that says that you can't, uh, um, well, if her particle, a better way of saying this is that in fact, if her particle went to the right, which is one alternative here, her laboratory must have gone to the left by an amount to keep the center of mass fixed. Uh, and correspondingly, if her particle went to the left, her laboratory must have gone to the right. Now, that isn't necessarily a very important effect for Alice or whatever, but if we're looking at the gravitational effects, the dipole of her laboratory, even though it only moved an incredibly tiny amount, uh, compensates for the dipole of the particle, and the leading effect is at quadrupole. So that is one thing that has to be taken into account. So Bob has a harder job of measuring the mass quadrupole rather than the electric dipole, but there's a corresponding effect that Alice doesn't emit. These are not unrelated facts, they're directly related to each other, that Alice doesn't emit dipole radiation, the entangled gravitation, entangling gravitational radiation will also be quadrupolar in nature, and therefore in a non-relativistic situation will be a lot smaller than, so Bob uh, has a much smaller effect to measure, but Alice has a much easier job in avoiding the emission of gravitational radiation. So you again get an estimate for the number of entangling gravitons, uh, and you have this estimate of what Bob can measure, and you have this limitation on what Bob can measure. When you put it all together, it is exactly the same as the electromagnetic case, except quadrupole replaces dipole. And again, if both of them are required to do their, to complete their experiment within a light travel time so that you'll have potential contradictions with causality, uh, if the dipole is if the quadrupole is small enough, the radiation won't destroy the coherence of the particle on its own, but in exactly the same way, Bob won't be able to get which path information. Whereas if uh, 
you make the quadrupole big enough for Bob to be able to measure it, uh, the radiation is going to destroy the coherence of Alice's particle. And who cares about what Bob does? That is the end of the show there. Uh, and Bob can't be blamed for the decoherence, even though he did make a which path measurement, but it had nothing. Well, it wasn't after the fact because it was at space like separations, but it wasn't relevant. So the conclusions to complete finish the talk is that in exactly the same way as in the electromagnetic case, uh, we would need these both vacuum fluctuations and quantization of radiation. Uh, I should have emphasized if I didn't already do so or didn't maybe didn't even mention. I mean, I analyzed the gravitational case using linearized gravity, uh, which has a perfectly good quantum theory. That's where I calculated the vacuum fluctuations, the quantization of radiation and everything. But these quantum properties that are valid for linearized gravity with the standard quantization are really essential. Uh, so the conclusion I would make uh, is that, you know, these features had better survive, at least in some form, uh, in uh, you know, a full quantum theory of gravity. Uh, and, uh, you know, gra gravity, well, linearized gravity for sure, but uh, that's what I use, but gravity really must possess these kinds of uh, properties of a quantum field. Of course, the alternative would, if you don't want to buy this, would be that, uh, you'd have to make drastic modifications to non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanics. But if we keep this, then the main point of the talk is we need to keep vacuum fluctuations and quantization of radiation in gravity in a form not radically different from what we would see in linearized gravity. Okay, I ran a little bit over, but not too badly. Uh, and that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much, Robert, for the wonderful talk. I'm sure there are plenty of questions. Uh, there are already a couple of hands raised. So if you want to ask questions, uh, please raise your hand and I will take care of moderate the order of, of people. So. The first hand raised was by uh, Onyan. So if you would like to unmute yourself, you can go. Onyan Oreshkov, if you are, you can unmute yourself. Okay, for, so, for some reason, I, I can't hear you, Onion. So let's, okay, let's uh, go to the next one on the list and then we'll come back to you. Uh, Jonathan Oppenheim, would you like to ask your question? Oh, um, I wasn't sure I was next. Um, I guess I'm wondering what you mean by drastic. Um, so we've, we've been studying at UCL these, um, these classical quantum dynamics and our interpretation of this, the Gedenken experiment is just that you need to have um, a stochastic um, interaction. So that's, um, and maybe, you know, one way to see that is just that, um, you know, one way of interpreting the experiment is that, um, is that if I have a, a quantum field, then I have, you know, depending on which slit it went through or which path it took, there's, two different states of the field um, and they can be different, but they can still be, have large overlaps. So you can't distinguish them. That's one way of interpreting it. Whereas for a classical 
system or a classical field, you cannot have different classical fields which are somehow not orthogonal. They'll be orthogonal if they're different. Um, but if there are distributions, if they're probably distributions, if your coupling is stochastic, then there's no problem at all. Um, and as someone who likes information loss, I'm wondering why, you know, would you be happy, would you consider that drastic if all that's required is that you have to have a stochastic interaction? Um, yeah, so I didn't have, uh, let's see, I guess I have the word drastic here. You know, I, you know, I haven't seriously thought of, uh, you know, what would be needed for, uh, uh, you know, how drastic you would need. So, I mean, you know, if you, uh, so don't take the, the word uh, seriously or literally whatever it might mean. Um, so, I mean, I think if, if, if you have, uh, you know, some model where, well, so first of all, if you keep the usual type of quantization, then of course we don't have to do anything and everything's fine. Uh, so, I mean, if you have a model where you can avoid these, you know, the potential contradictions of this experiment, but uh, you know, but either not have the vacuum fluctuations or the quantization of radiation that is essential the way I describe things, I think that would be very interesting. And I'm not saying you can't do it and I, and I don't have a, you know, definition of drastic in mind that was, you know, just a word that seemed like the right level of word to put in the last sentence of the conclusions, but it's not anything more than that. All right, thank you. Um, next question by Faye Doker, if you would like to unmute yourself. Hi, Bob, it's really nice to see you. Um, yeah, very nice to see you although too. Very strange, <laughs> always <laughs> to see people in this way, but um, it's also nice to see the uh, University of Chicago there. So I have a I don't know whether this is a sort of conceptual question or more of a technical question. So if we concentrate just on the electromagnetic field, which is always easier to, you know, conceptually <laughs> than the gravitational field, does this work say anything about whether or not a quantum superposition of what I would call you know, macroscopically or semi-classically distinct electromagnetic fields is meaningful. I mean, in, in one sense, what you described about um, Bill Unruh's argument about the mm -hmm. possibility, you know, the, the possibility of, of recohering Alice's um, superposition of the two, um, of the two charged particles each particle with its own Coulomb field, the mm -hmm. possibility of recohering them suggests that you, you do have a genuine quantum superposition of, of sort of macroscopically, semi-classically semi -classically distinct electromagnetic fields. But then it seems like the conclusion is somewhat, blurs that somewhat and says, well, maybe, you know, the, the quantum fuzz around those two fields is such that, you know, the variance quantum variance around them is such that, in fact, they, they're not actually distinct. You know, they do, they overlap to an extent that you can't actually claim that you've got to, you know, a, re, a genuine superposition of macroscopically distinct um, quantum uh, EM fields, so. Um, is there a question? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, question? So I, <laughs> I think that, no, I mean, I, I think this is, is a, that, a good, you know, question, I think, I mean, my, the view I would have on that, I think is very compatible with what Bill Unruh has written in this paper that I referred to on, on false decoherence. So if you, if you ask, 
over here when these particles, you know, are separated in the beams, are they decohered or not? I, I think one could argue uh, pretty strongly that at this point they are decohered because they really are entangled with different electromagnetic fields, though I don't, uh, I mean, in the, I don't actually know how to quantify uh, that difference. I mean, in, Bill had a model with massive, with a massive scalar field instead of an electromagnetic field uh, that these were coupled to where you could make, I think, uh, more quantitative arguments as to how much these were decohered. But it, it nevertheless, I mean, whatever you say, these are or they aren't, it, what is unequivocally true is that if Alice were to recombine her particle adiabatically enough, and adiabatically enough is exactly what, you know, was estimated in the calculations, you know, so that no entangling photon is emitted, uh, then, you know, the, you know, she would get interference effects. So I think you can argue that, you know, the particle really was decohered here, but it managed to restore its coherence when it got brought together. And, you know, that I think is, you know, the false decoherence terminology would be uh, you know, then very, I mean, to call this decoherence, but false decoherence, I think, would convey the right uh, message. Uh, but, you know, there may be some alternative viewpoint which would keep, say, that the particle is still cohered, and it's only after a photon is emitted or something like that that it really is decohered. But, I mean, I would uh, probably su subscribe to the, it is decohered here, but it's a false decoherence language or way of describing it. But I mean, it's more of a semantic uh, uh, argument than, a, you know, than there's some different physics. Well, this was, yeah, the, the, this idea of achieving a super a quantum superposition of of different electromagnetic fields. I mean, we're used to you know classical superpositions of electromagnetic fields, of course, um, but a quantum superposition, you know, that's well, obviously that would be experimentally challenging. Do, do we actually do, do we know has that been achieved? I mean, this is completely I mean, separate from you know from this particular case, but. Uh, have people done such a thing um, in the lab? Yeah. Uh, 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 let's see. Uh, Cheslev, uh, who I saw was on earlier, would be probably better equipped to, than me to say what might be achievable. I mean, it, I think definitely hasn't been achieved. Uh, uh, I, I'm quite sure. I mean, you know, measuring this electromagnetic field difference is exactly what Bob would be doing. I mean, as far as Bob is concerned, you know, this particle might remain in this superposition for an arbitrarily long time. Uh, you know, Bob doesn't necessarily know that this particle is being recohered. So he is measuring exactly this difference in the electromagnetic field. Now the quantum properties of the electromagnetic, of, of the Coulomb-like field, well, okay, but I mean the Coulomb-like field definitely has to be entangled with, uh, you know, Alice's particle. I mean that to be consistent with Maxwell's equations or whatever. Um, 
So now you might consider the case where Alice uh, takes a really, really long time. I mean, of course, let's do the uh, case where there's a strong dipole and Bob can actually make this measurement. But instead of Alice recombining her particle in this short time that would necessarily involve a mission of radiation, let her bring the particle back adiabatically. Uh, so there's no entangling radiation and without Bob, she would succeed. But now Bob's particle is entangled with hers and Bob, uh, you know, would be convicted in court uh, for destroying Alice's experiment if charges were brought. So what was this false decoherence with the Coulomb fields, Bob has kind of, you know, gotten himself entangled with those Coulomb fields. And now those, you know, those fields, there's no, pho there's no photon emission in any of this, but the electro, you know, the electromagnetic field or, well, the Coulomb fields will go back to what they were, but there will, the coherence of Alice's particle will be destroyed by Bob. It can't be done within, with both of them doing the experiment within a light travel time. But if you allow Alice to do an experiment over a long, much longer time, uh, so, but it's really the original false decoherence uh, that now is ultimately producing a real decoherence in this version of the experiment where there are no photons emitted. Thank you. Um, Nick, you okay. get it's your turn. Just unmuting. Thank you. I, I did see Kaslov in the list, though. I wondered if he was had a finger on that because um, Bob was asking if he wanted to come in. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah about yeah, what ahead. is practical or whatever. I mean, people have talked about even gravitational-like versions of you know this kind of e experiment, uh, but definitely not done them. Just have maybe since it's a follow-up, if you want I to. I can just uh, as a follow-up question. I mean, I do share the floor with experimenters, but that doesn't mean that I really know what they're doing. But at least, I mean, for the charged particles, because uh, you always have around charged particles, it's very hard to keep coherence. But at least I know that from the experiments from Marcus Ant with the macroscopic molecules, they can achieve. 100,000 atomic units uh, of mass is put in a reasonable distance such that they see interference experiments. Of course, this is something that people want to go beyond and several orders of magnitudes with these new experiments with um, uh, dielectric spheres. But, uh, but maybe just one more comment is about distinguishability of of these two states produced by charges of the masses. Like, I think that uh, unless you really change something in our understanding of non-relativistic quantum theory, that there should be no difference in distinguishing these two possibilities. Once you put, for example, the charge along one path, definite path, or along the other path, you have a pro-particle distance at some point you will realize whether the path was left or right, whether the Ellis path particles put in the left and right. And that's the same if you put in the superposition. It, and it will get entangled. You can measure the pro-particle bob and you will find out then one or the other path. If we deny that, that would mean denying of the uh, mirror superposition principle, I would say, in all of the quantum mechanics. I wouldn't know how to say this unless you attack exactly the hurt of the quantum theory in all of the case. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a small comment. Thanks. 
Um, Nick, would you like to continue? If Robert yeah, thank you. Thanks for the you know the really nice presentation. And I've been reading the paper with a group of other philosophers as well, and found it really, you know we really appreciate it. But it was great. Um, so I have a, I mean I have a couple of small comments. Um, I'll do one and put my hand up again if you if you like. So and actually the first one was about the uh, um, the vacuum fluctuation so, um, sort of side of the argument and what's happening you know what's happening to Bob. Just wondered on sort of this thought. I mean slightly more generally, what's kind of required is um, something like there'd be something that puts this lower bound on Bob's um, resolution ability. So, but it be the Planck length. Um, and I guess there are other arguments to something along that kind of effect. I mean, that there's sort of classic arguments, for instance, that if you try to measure below the Planck length, you'll end up creating a black hole. So I just wondered if you thought about, you know, how, yeah, just alternatives to the you know, vacuum fluctuation argument. So, I don't mean that as a criticism, just sort yeah. of feeling out other kinds of ways you might get to that conclusion. Uh, right. Well, I mean, I think any argument, I would, you know, this is a loose statement, but I, you know, it's hard to see how any argument uh, on whatever its nature on length uh, measurement, you know, position measurement in quantum gravity is going to yield a result other than Planck length. I mean, that, that is the only, you know, quantity of dimension length that you could, uh, you know, make out of the, out of the fundamental theory. Now the, uh, you know, in this situation, I'm really just treating linearized gravity and I'm, you know, doing the same sort of analysis of geodesic deviation uh, and what the quantum fluctuation, uh, what quantum fluctuations would do to that, to, the, to relative position measurements. I mean, exactly the same type of analysis as, you know, went into this kind of estimate for what happens in, uh, you know, how a charged particle gets knocked around by the vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. But so there wouldn't be any black holes or anything like that in this kind of argument. But I mean, it's, uh, you know, again, if you, you know, use sort of time energy uncertainty relations and you, you know, try to get enough uh, or, you know, yeah. usual quantum mechanic uncertainty relations and sort of what would you need to keep uncertainties in, you know, position or time, you know, what, what would uh, uh, approach right. that? I mean, maybe you know, and you'll, you'll come up with arguments, you know, that if yeah. you tried to measure, you know, something smaller than a Planck time, you'd need an apparatus big enough to, you know, produce a black hole or something. I mean, I, I, I mean, but maybe, be... um, sort of conversely, is there some non, some way to get to a, a length, you know, a minimum scale like that, you know, without the quantum gravity? I mean, I guess you want, you need, if that's the number you're looking for, you need an H bar, but maybe that could be coming from the quantization of matter rather than the quantization of gravity. I don't have any such argument in mind. I just wondered if, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, that's possible. And, and there's certainly, you know, I would certainly say there are a variety of different arguments, like the kind you allude to, alluded to, which, you know, that you'd need enough mass to make in a small enough region to make a black hole if you wanted to measure this. I mean, I've seen those arguments before. I don't think, you know, I'm not disagreeing with those, uh, but you can, you know, in this you know, much more <laughs> ordinary quantum field theory way, you know, will also give you this, this answer. Okay. Can I ask my other, I think it's a sort of short and maybe even more naive kind of question. So to see the, uh, to see the interference effect, 
I take it you'd actually need more than one run of this, right? I mean, yeah. is there a sort of single well, I, run I'm, view of an interference? I'm granting, or... I'm granting yeah. some large number of runs of this, yes. And so you kind of want all of those to be space-like separate. I mean, the whole runs, the whole series yeah. of runs to be space-like separate. I mean, it comes back to what you mean by drastic modifications again to think about. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, well, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying what is you know what would be technologically feasible even in the next century or two and i'm not saying what budget you'd need and all that but yeah I, i'm allowing all this i'm you know i know of no reason in principle why this can't be done i know an awful lot of practical reasons that would get in the way um but yeah, and and to see the difference between these two shaded curves, uh, yeah, you yeah. undou undoubtedly need to repeat the experiment many times and so on. Well, I very much take this experiment in the context of sort of clarifying how to think about what's happening in some of the experiments that people are actually, in the slightly different experiments that people are actually talking about doing in the next decade or, or, or two, so, okay. Thanks very much. This was very helpful. Thank you. Marius, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for the wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to first comment on something that Faye said, if I may, that, uh, yeah, it's true. We don't, we, there is no experiment that shows the macroscopic, a superposition of macroscopic states of the electromagnetic field of the Colombian part. Um, and this is one of the things that I was asking the same to Marcus Aspelmeyer. This is one of the surprises that uh, it looks the difficulty is similar for the electromagnetic case and the gravitational case um, of doing a gravity emitted entanglement growth experiment. Um, so that was just a comment. Robert, I have uh, the following question. Trying to understand, I mean, not, I totally understand it's a Gedankian experiment and it's very important for. Uh, seeing what exactly consistency requirements you need and what is needed to respect uh, big physical principles like causality. Um, and this, uh, you, you need to have the kind of fluctuations and the quantization of the field. I wanted to ask a bit the reverse. Let's assume now that you do have some all powerful experimentalists that can do the experiment. Um, can we conclude from the data? something about the quantization of the gravitational field. So if Bob can do whatever he wants, and this does not affect Alice, unless she, these inequalities are not satisfied, can we then conclude that uh, the gravitational field must have quantum fluctuations or must be quantized or both? Um, okay, so I mean, I analyze this, experiment, I mean, assuming, you know, well, in the gravitational case, the quantization given by linearized gravity, and, you know, I, you know, the consistency was explained. Now, if you were, if you wanted to do an experiment to kind of test the assumptions that went into that, the quantum fluctuations, and the uh, quantization of radiation or whatever, then there's no reason to have both Alice and Bob together. I mean, you could just, you know, Bob could do his experiment and see if, the, you know, with some fixed dipole, uh, quadrupole in that, in this case, you know, field or whatever produced in some other manner, you could make a bigger one even, but, uh, you know, you, you could just see, uh, um, uh, you know, are the quantum, well, you don't even need the dipole field. You can just see, our, you know, is are the fluctuations that Bob gets in position of his particle from what would classically be predicted, you know, is that this delta x that I computed here, that's what quantum fluctuations would give. And if, you know, if Bob can do better than that, then there aren't such big quantum fluctuations. And if Bob, you know, does worse than that, there are more. So, I mean, that would be a, that 
you know, you could from data like that confirm or not confirm the quantum, the vacuum fluctuation type uh, ideas. And again, Alice could separately do her experiment and see if if there is there are entangling photons emitted and so on. I mean, she doesn't need Bob for that. Uh, so, I mean, there would be, again, these wouldn't necessarily be the best ways of testing these things, but if you, if money was spent on this experiment and it was actually carried out, then Alice's data by itself and Bob's data by itself would have a lot of, you know, information about this. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Jonathan, have another question. I've already asked one, so maybe since this is my second one, Flaminia can go first before me. Um, I think Chaslav had his hand raised before me. No, but you, you haven't asked yet, so. <laughs> so Flaminia, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, no, I just <laughs> I actually, I just wanted to add uh, something to this to Mario's uh, question. So, if you perform this type of experiment in the lab, so basically, if you manage to uh, get two particles A and B entangled via the gravitational interaction, then of course, I mean, experimentally, it's very challenging because you have to uh, make sure that nothing else except for the gravitational interaction is causing this entanglement, and uh, then you can. So we have a paper with Thomas Galli and John Selby on, on that, where we take uh, a theory independent approach, which is typical of, of like generalized probabilistic theories. And what you can show with this type of approach is that uh, you, have, uh, you have an OGO theorem. So you have three conditions that cannot all be through at, at once, which are that the subsystem independence of A and B which at space like separation basically coincides with no signaling. So this, this is no faster than light signaling that um, Bob mentioned. Then the, the second thing is um, that gravity locally mediates entanglement. So it is a physical degree of freedom and that you should consider as entangled with the matter degrees of freedom of A and B. So which is also the same thing that we have in, uh, uh, in this other paper. Uh, and the third one is that gravity is classical, where by classical we mean the textbook definition, which is non disturbing measurements. And if you, so basically, the, all, these three cannot be all true at once. And this is a, a bit similar like what you, to, to what you have in Bell's theorem. So it, basically, you have to make sure that the two, the initial two assumptions are uh, satisfied so that you do not have any faster than light signaling and that gravity med locally mediates entanglement. And so I also talked to Marcus Aspelmeyer, you can uh, check, the, especially the second uh, condition, it, it, it's going to be very challenging, but uh, there is a way of checking the, uh, experimentally that gravity mediates entanglement locally. And then you have to conclude that gravity is non-classical. but. Uh, the fact that you conclude that gravity is non-classical does not necessarily imply that it is quantum. So you don't necessarily have the whole apparatus of quantum field theory that you can bring in. And uh, it is still an open question how to uh, rule it down to just quantum theory. But I mean, at least you, you, you can still show that it's, that it's non-classical. And also, I mean, um, there are theories that are neither classical nor quantum and that satisfied these other two conditions. But of course, I mean, the interesting case is if you can really pin it down to quantum theory, and this is, this is still open, but you can conclude that it has to be non-classical. So that's what I wanted to add. Yeah, thank you, Flamin. I, I know your paper, I, didn't, I should have thought that it's relevant to answering my question. I will look at it again. Thank you. Robert, would you would you like to add something? Oh uh, no, I, I don't okay. have anything to add. And I mean, uh, as you may have noticed, uh, Flaminia is Flaminia is a uh, co-author on this paper as well. So. <laughs>
And then uh, Jonathan, if you want to ask your question now. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, this is maybe a follow-up to Faye's, or um, at least inspired by her question, which is that in, in these discussions, you often people often talk about the near field and the far field and distinguish the two in, in say, the electromagnetic case where, um, so that, where the electron, um, you know, the, the near field knows very much which path the electron has taken. Um, and if I were to measure the near field, I would, I would disturb this, this, I would disrupt the interference experiment. Um, and the, and the far field, which is, is what, and, and this is the false decoherence. So this is, so you have this, you know, the, the, the electromagnetic field very close to the electron knows which, which path is taking, but then it will get recohered when, when we move the, the paths back together. Um, and I guess Bob is, is measuring the far field, um, which, you know, we, sorry, if there was a Bremsford line which was emitted. And you didn't talk about those, you didn't make that distinction. And I was wondering, it seemed almost like, so that I have two questions. It seems like they were almost, it was almost as if, if Bob is going to make a near field detection, it will be because Alice jiggles her particle so much that it, or makes the path so wide that it causes a Bremsford line to admit to be emitted. So it was almost like somehow she will excite the far field. Um, and I'm wondering, so whether this, this distinction is important in the electromagnetic case and what happens in the gravita and in the gravitational case, I guess, cause you're just doing linearized gravity, you don't see, you don't see gravity waves or is it? No, you would, I mean, it's so, you would. Again, and, is that, and, and is it the same importance that, that, that that if if Alice does something, it's because she's emitted a gravity wave, which Bob will detect. Um, yeah, well, I mean, so that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with, uh, I, I, I think I understood, and I think I'm in agreement with what you were saying, but there, there is, interesting stuff in the language and the way you described it and so on, which, you know, is, so first of all, I mean, with the near, the near and far field, you know, are really, what's near and far is sort of, you know, frequency dependent, I mean, time scale. So I had Alice, uh, you know, separate her particle into these two paths way, way back in the past so that there's no question in some sense that Bob is, a, I mean, she did it, she did the separation carefully enough not to emit any radiation that was implicit in what I said, but Bob is in the near field zone, even though he's very far away, at least as far as he knows here. Now, whether or not, Bob, whether or not Bob can do the experiment, you know, succeed in his experiment, he can do the experiment, but whether or not this result is buried in the noise uh, doesn't have anything to do with, if he's doing this within a light travel time, has nothing whatever to do with Alice, you know, completing her experiment or not, as all, as far as he knows, Alice might have just continued her beam straight on, beam straight on, and not done anything. Um, but if Alice does, so let's assume that Alice's dipole is big enough that Bob can make this measurement. If Alice then does her recombination within a light travel time she will emit photons, a photon or photons. And you can then, and this is really ties in with the recent work that I alluded to, you could then interpret Bob as having measured this, the photon that Alice emitted. Now, of course, Bob is doing his measurement at space-like separations, uh, so it's a little weird to be talking about Bob measuring the photon that Alice emitted, but that's right. I mean, that, that's something, you know, uh, 
you know, Bill Unruh and I wrote this paper 35 years ago or so on what happens when a detector emits a Rindler particle, uh, an accelerating detector emits a, a Rindler particle, and it's the same uh, kind of thing there. I mean, that was with accelerating things, and there was, you know, a more clear-cut causality kind of situation. But the mode function of the particle that gets emitted by an accelerating detector in one Rindler wedge, that mode function is concentrated in the other Rindler wedge. And, you know, the other, another observer will measure, a, you know, a perfect correlation of particles. I mean, if you could measure whether or not, you know, if you can measure exactly the particle state, if there are n particles in the right wedge, there'll be exactly n particles in the left wedge. This all comes from the, you know, space-like correlations of the quantum field that it had in the first place in the vacuum state. So, uh, you know, it, so it's a little funny now, I mean, to using, this is the language that I was talking about because from one perspective, Bob is in the near zone. I'm sorry, is, yeah, is in the near zone. That's what I wanted to say, uh, because kind of everything is in the near zone because this was done arbitrarily far in the past. Uh, but in another sense, Bob is in the far zone relative to the time scale needed to, for Alice to, you know, uh, close the superposition. So you could either interpret Bob as having measured the near zone Coulomb fields here, or you could view Bob as having detected the photon that came from the radiation due to closing the superposition. So it is really strange. Uh, but, you know, I think that's all fine. And of course, maybe Alice decided at the last minute without being able to tell Bob not to close the superposition, then Bob is just measuring the near zone, Coul near zone Coulomb field and there's nothing else to, to say. And he is causing decoherence in Alice's particle. Thank you. Thank you. Cheslav, you can ask yeah, your thanks. question. Uh, so, yes, I, I would like to comment on, on a causality and the necessity of repeating experiment many times. But just before that, I, something what, what just Rob said and, and Jonathan asked, like, and I repeat maybe what, what was said that if we would have a, a particle either one or the other position, these two positions would produce classically distinguishable Coulomb potential, no matter how far B is. It's only that in order to find out which path it is, Bell would need more time if he's further away from X. But they are classically distinguishable. And in that sense, in the nature of this field, there is no difference, I would say, if it is close or, or far away. It's the same Coulomb potential that depends on the on the distance and therefore the relative distance is in, in, in two cases is different and there must be different. But now back to this in, uh, question about causality and the necessity of repeating experiment many times because uh, people usually identify a signaling as some kind of a one shot thing. Like I did a signal, you, you send me a signal in this one shot or you don't. But, and here it seems like you have to repeat experience many times to see whether there's a signaling. So is, is it operationally well-defined? And so I would, there, there are two possible answers to this. First is uh, that you can perform all these experiments in parallel. Like you prepare many of them and you put all of them close to Alice and Bob, and then you perform in parallel and then you read out probability distribution. But actually it's not needed because signaling is uh, forbidden even probabilistically. 
So what you can do, you can put your detector, for example, at the minimum, expected minimum of the interference pattern. And then whenever you see the particle there, you will say, oh, it's got entangled with Bob. And sometimes you, you don't see the particle and then you are not sure. You sometimes you will make an error because you simply didn't catch a uh, particle there. Or not necessarily it was the minimum really interference, but that doesn't matter. Even in, in a tiny fraction of cases, you are not allowed to signal superluminally. And so it should be forbidden. Thanks. Yeah, I, I agree fully with that. Then Marius. Yeah, if there's nobody else, I wanted to, okay. Um, I, I, okay, <laughs> let me see how to phrase this. So I see some tension, slight tension, very slight in the way the paper is written. And I'm wondering if this is because of uh, different ways of thinking between Robert and uh, Chaslav on uh, what the claim is exactly, because it's um, about the relative and the non-relative, because it's clearly said that um, uh, distinguishing relative and non-relative is very artificial, especially you're talking about the local measurements because it's the field and the field has both relative and non-relative components that you're going to pick up. But the, the, the paper, if I remember, well finishes or the essay that you go won the first prize in the Gravity Foundation for with the claim that this demonstrates that uh, the non-radiative part of the field does carry quantum information. Um, so we got very worked up by this. And of course, I'm sure that Robert is aware because what we did is read uh, Robert's book to understand this point, uh, where you see how delicate it is to define, first of all, what you mean by radiative. Essentially, first of all, radiation is teleological. You are talking about what will go to infinity, the energy that is um, going to be picked up by a surface integral of infinity. Second, in linearized gravity, it's you're talking about energy of gravitational waves, which means you're talking about self-interaction, second order effect. You have to go second order, find another Timinu, put it back in first order. It's not um, um, a very, it's a, it's a less clean uh, distinction than electromagnetism, what is meant by radiative and non-radiative in the first place. But I have the feeling that Chaslav wants to say that, no, this is about the Colombian potential. And I uh, was just uh, wondering what comments you might have on this. Uh, what, what is your uh, perspective? If there is anything said specifically about the non-radiative part of the field from this Getankian experiment? Um, yeah, so I'm not sure, I, and maybe uh, Cheslov would like to comment too, but I'm not sure I'm, I, so the radiative part of the field, I would call, you know, whatever gets out to null infinity. Um, I'm not sure what I would, how I would, you know, talk about you know, sort of distinguish the Coulomb part and the, you know, radiative part, I mean, especially uh, locally. And in fact, what I was, you know, just saying in, in, re in response to Jonathan's question is that, you know, Bob actually doesn't know here, or it could be, you know, if this experiment is done in this way and this dipole is large, Bob could, possibly be measuring the purely Coulomb effects of this, and maybe Alice doesn't recombine her particle, or maybe he is measuring the effects of, you know, the photon that goes off to infinity. Uh, but, you know, part of that photon is all at space, you know, I mean, photons are not localized in time, and they're not localized in the way, you know, you might expect or whatever, I mean, in, you know, like in classical radiation. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, I'm not sure that there, well, I'm not sure how to make this kind of uh, distinction, but it's sort of the, but the electromagnetic field, the full electromagnetic field is certainly uh, 
you know, involved in what happens with Bob and what Bob's state is at the end and how correlated it is with Alice's state. Uh, I don't know if uh, Chaslov wants to add some comments or make some orthogonal or contradictory comments or whatever. No, I think I fully agree. No, uh, I, I wasn't sure what, what, what Marius was uh, putting in my mouth, but uh, no, I'm, I'm joking. No, there is the Cologne part, which is the part of uh, that uh, establishing the field before t equals zero, and it's already there after t equals zero, but the argument also includes the radiative part if Alice wants to close uh, her superposition fast. Um, so I think that we even write in the paper that we see also this a kind of a support of these arguments of uh, uh, Bose et al. and Verletto and Vidral in a sense that they consider only um, uh, static uh, fields and Coulomb part, but this argument suggests that you can't have one without also having radiation. And somehow uh, the two things are combined. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's all. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Ah, yeah, no, so uh, I just, yeah, I just wanted to add that at least the way I see that this last comment that you mentioned is just because the non radiative part is the responsible for entanglement. And this is usually what uh, people discard as just being uh, like a harmless. Uh, a harmless potential that is just a remnant of the gauge freedom, basically. And instead, of course, then the argument is not complete uh, if you do not add the radiative part of the field, whether it's electromagnetic or gravitational. And but uh, at least the way I, I've always read that, that that final comment is not as a tension, rather as like a specification that it's despite you only have the Newton potential, which is responsible for the entanglement, and that's not something, I mean, this is a correct uh, description of what is going on, then you have to take into account also the radiative part. So that's just a Okay, there are no more questions. Uh, I have one, though. Um, in the experiment that you have described, you are using the formalism of quantum mechanics and you are using notions such as uh, one photon is emitted. I was wondering whether there were a fully quantum field theory description of this experiment, like using QFT in cast space time to have a description of, of this experiment. And uh, I thought that this could have bring light on the relation between Alice and Bob and why the, the, what they are doing is related. Um, well, I'm not, what, uh, did you have something in mind in terms of what the curved space time part would add? I mean, I would think you could do you know, everything that I've described in both the gravitational, the electromagnetic and the linearized gravitational case about a curved space time. Uh, I mean, it would have to be a stationary space time. I mean, it's very important that, you know, we establish this kind of stationary type situation at the beginning of the experiment, otherwise, you know, there's sort of radiation all over the place and I don't know. But if we did it in a uh, stationary curved space-time background, I'm not, I doubt if there would be any difference, but I'm not sure whether there was something you had in, in mind in terms of what might be different. I was, yeah, I was considering in having a non-stationary space-time precisely to take uh, into account the effect of the masses which are moving during the experiment. Mm 
Um, yeah, so I mean, if we're not doing this in the context of linearized perturbation theory off some background, I, you know, that just would make everything. Well, I, I, okay, if we're doing the electromagnetic experiment, uh, you know, we could put that in some arbitrary space time that, that, you know, the linearized gravity, would, we really need to be working off some background and working in perturbation theory to, you know, to follow through on the analysis. But the trouble, if you do a non-stationary space time, then Alice, if the space time is non-stationary around here, I mean, Alice's particles are probably radiating all along here. They're probably, you know, the radiation, you know, these paths are different. The radiation would be different from these paths. Uh, and she's probably going to lose coherence, you know, just due to photon emission from the non-stationarity of the space-time affecting the paths differently and affecting radiation differently. I mean, if it doesn't affect that, then you could probably have approximated the space-time as stationary or whatever. But I mean, the with a curved space-time, you could get different, you know, fall off of the dipole field or things like that. I don't think that would end up affecting the analysis. I mean, that's my statement there is based more on this recent work where, uh, you know, one can kind of argue that the stationary field affects, uh, you know, kind of causally outside of where Alice is doing her experiment uh, will, if you're kind of getting rid of those stationary fields by closing Alice's superposition, that will result in radiation going off to infinity of the same degree, you know, in a in a manner that is closely related to how big the quantum fluctuations are relative to the effect that Bob can measure. I, that wasn't explained, but I think, uh, you know, if you want it genuinely non-stationary, you're going to have a mess. And, you know, Alice is going to have a much more difficult job just maintaining coherence if these paths are different. Uh, and if, but if the curved space time can be treated as stationary, uh, you know, then I think there's probably not going to be uh, much of a difference or any significant difference. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I don't see any more hand raised. Um, neither questions in the chat so i would suggest that we stop here it's more than a, an hour and a half that we are discussing so thank you once again robert uh, for your talk and for all the discussion thank you everyone for having uh, attended this seminar and uh, i wish a nice summer to all of you and we see each other back for the kiss seminar next autumn Goodbye. Okay. Bye.